first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, buenos dias, it's good to have everybody here. Uh, my name is uh, Jose Rico and I'm the Deputy Director of the White House Initiative Office in the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, today I'm going to serve as your facilitator and I want to just like to go over a couple of things before we begin. Uh, since we only have 20 minutes, uh, I want to make sure that we jump right into it, but I just want to remind folks of some of the ground rules and some of the special things that we're doing here today. As you, if you all notice, we're going to be live streamed today at whitehouse.gov slash live. Uh, so for uh, today's session, uh, for those of you that are here, you're going to be live streaming some most of the day. So if somebody doesn't know that you're here and you don't want them to know that you're here, <laughs> this might not be a good thing for you. Uh, secondly, we really encourage all of you who are on Twitter or Facebook to, this is an opportunity to twit up and uh, use uh, that. Make sure people know that you're here at the White House. And any of the comments or anything that you hear today, uh, please uh, also uh, share that with folks. And like I mentioned earlier, we have members of the press here, so this is something that um, we're hoping uh, some of you might be available if they want to be able to talk to you after the session, so that would be great. Uh, again, we only have 20 minutes, and uh, I'm going to have uh, Carmel Martin uh, present and introduce herself briefly so we could jump into the questions. Um, and again, we want to be able to make sure that you go into these questions with some very specific questions. We uh, would discourage you to go into long presentations or promotion of things. We really want to get to some of the policy issues or any of the specific issues you're dealing with in your community because we have, again, uh, one of the top people in the U.S. Department of Education here that could give you some very good uh, uh, answers or be able to connect you to uh, people that could help you on those issues. Uh, and again, finally, uh, if I cut you off, I apologize. We need to. Uh, get this moving and, uh, and get as many people through here. Uh, and so what I want you to do is that when uh, you do ask your questions, that you present yourself, your name, and your organization. We have uh, somebody here who's taking notes. And any questions that you have that uh, we, want, we want to follow up on, we're going to give Carmel and all of the uh, presenters that information so we could be able to do some follow-up with yourselves. And again, I apologize for not being able to do any long uh, introductions. If you have a question, please introduce yourself. And that's the way we're going to get to know who's in the room. So without any further ado, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, just uh, introduce and present Carmel Martin, who's the Assistant Secretary for the Office of, of Planning and uh, Budget at the U.S. Department of Education. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to, to spend some time with you, and I really am going to be brief because I want to hear from you, not just any questions you have about what we're doing, but if you have advice for us and things we should be doing or things we could be doing better. Um, as Jose said, I'm the Assistant Secretary in charge of policy and budget at the Department of Education. What that means is I am um, one of the lucky ones who gets to work on issues across the entire department. So I don't just do K-12 or early learning or post-secondary. I um, help the secretary and the president think about the continuum of education. Um, I guess just to sort of frame the work that we do, I would say that everything that we do at the Department of Ed is basically driven by two overarching goals. One is to ensure that there's um, more equitable educational opportunities in the United States, and the second is to ensure that our students um, are globally competitive. Um, those two goals are really not mutually exclusive. Actually, I would argue that the latter depends on the form. That if we don't do a better job of providing equitable and high quality educational opportunities for our students, we are not going to be globally competitive. Um, the president has given us a frame to drive our work and his goal that we once again become first in the world in terms of college completion. When you look at those global statistics, the data around um, international assessments, what we see is what we don't do as well as higher performing nations do is provide consistently high quality educational opportunities for all students. The, the countries that are outperforming us internationally are countries that do just that. They, regardless of income, disability status, um, they're delivering high quality educational opportunities. So I think it's incumbent on all of us to figure out how we can do a better job of that in the United States. And we need to think about how to do that <clears throat> in a holistic way. So we really do think about a cradle to career um, lens in terms of our work. So that means we are as focused on how to improve early learning opportunities as we are in, 
in terms of how to reform No Child Left Behind and improve elementary and secondary education, as well as focusing on college, not just access, but completion. And I think that's something the President has really brought to the table at the federal level. I've worked in federal education policy for about 15 years, and really the conversation was very much about access until um, President Obama became president and said, no, the goal isn't access, the goal is completion. So we've been really, really focused on that in terms of our work at the post-secondary level and making sure that post-secondary opportunities are preparing people for careers of the future. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and um, take any questions or comments or just get a conversation going. Quick question, quick question. Uh, name and organization. Uh, Jorge Alvarez with the Cuban American National Foundation, and curious on what we're doing to, especially with the public schools, to get courses online, uh, to almost extend that school year to be teaching things online and leverage that aspect of it since we may have a shortage of teachers, etc. And disregarding the fact that there may not be access to the computer to the internet, but really to complement the fact that school days keep getting shorter and you know, greater access to the time is not the next way to keep the learning cycle going throughout the year. Absolutely true. So we've been looking to promote um, using technology as a lever to improve access to high quality education in our blueprint for reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. We have um, tried to weave education technology throughout all of the programs. An example that I would give is um, our literacy program. We have a, an application process that's in cycle right now and we um, encourage applicants to propose the use of technology to, to propose more effective literacy programs. Um, we, we also have worked very closely with the FCC in terms of ensuring that there's better access to broadband and, and um, the internet for schools and libraries. Um, and um, in our current budget, we've proposed an ARPA-ED uh, modeled on DARPA at the Department of Defense, and the purpose of that initiative is to really invest in research and development around how technology could be used to expand um, educational opportunities. Those are some of the things that we're working on. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jesse Beth Jones. I'm the president of Comunidades Latinas Unidas in Minnesota. Many years ago, I trained with Dr. Edwards Deming, who helped to rebuild Japan at and uh, he believed greatly in uh, investing in, in people. I've written a chapter for an international book, taking a family-centric approach, building around the idea of the aspirational values of families. And we have found great success building around this question, what are your great hopes and dreams for each other's future? And I think for Latinos and for America, somehow we have to rediscover that great sense of what it means about the legacy of everyone who's combined to advance the next generation. And we're going to achieve excellence in education, which I have been involved in, gifted and talented education. Uh, if we're going to win that future, we have to invest in the demand side of the equation. And that's around the family aspiration goals to advance uh, education, to advance the quality of life for the children. That's a different approach. We have the supply side approach in education institutions to do that. But we have to harness the power and engineer the innovation of the American spirit that profoundly exists in America's Hispanic population. I think that's really important. I think we we uh, are a little bit more comfortable on the, the supply side because yeah. we feel like we can control it. And um, the demand side is just a little bit harder for us to get our arms around, at least at, at the federal level. Um, we have proposed doubling the investment in family and parent engagement in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. Um, but we also want to see if we can ensure that those investments are being more effective. I mean, c under current law, there's a 1% set aside, and our sense is that it's very focused on process as opposed to actually programs that engage and help to inform parents and families. So if you have any ideas of how to structure those investments or drive those investments so they're really getting at the issue rather than just process. Let me just as a follow-up, the greatest stimulus program in the United States of America was the GI Bill after World War II. It created uh, a middle class. It was an investment in those GIs coming back. We have to rethink how do we engage millions of Americans from our rich diversity of who we are 
to take that same approach towards investing in families of all around that goal of what is it, your hopes and dreams for your children's future. That speaks to the heart of who we are as Americans, and speaks to the heart and soul of who we are and overcoming anything that's before us as people and as a country as well. Yes. Uh, Carmel, thank, you, thank you for being here. I just sort of wanted to bring up uh, two issues. One is, I think the, the misconception that American education is failing. Because we have the, the best secondary education system in the world. Clearly, those people are being created somewhere. Right? And uh, the world flies to the United States, China, and others to get their people educated here. Clearly, the people we're educating, those people are coming from our schools. And so too often, sort of, we focus on, on teachers and testing teachers when I think the problems are, have, have to do with funding and making sure we can move forward. But on a secondary issue, the administration just released <clears throat> its policy or its position on the sort of alternative education for post-graduation, you know, the, the special uh, uh, schools that are created to train nurses and other special career, I don't want to use vocation because these, I think, in the end, are career choices that people make. Is, does the administration want, uh, plan to invest more now that we've sort of corrected what we thought were ills of the system? Do we want to invest more in financing and putting more people through this system so that we can get there? Finally, my name is Joe Garcia, and I work for an engineering firm called CSA, the largest Hispanic engineering firm in the country. Okay, thank you. Um, so the the regulations that you're referring to are um, apply to um, career and technical post-secondary institutions, and we, we feel like we have invested and would like to continue those investments in post-secondary access. The, the programs that we have would be available whether you go to a career and technical institution or a more traditional two or four year degree program, nonprofit program. Um, under the President's leadership, we have increased the number of students receiving Pell Grants by 50%. Our investment Pell Grants when the President came into office were around uh, $15 billion. It is uh, well over $30 billion today, which actually creates a big problem for us from a budget standpoint. We need to find the, the funds to do that, but I think it's a, a good problem to have, unlike many of our other budget problems, because it means that more low-income students are going to college and getting the support they need to be successful. We've also had um, unprecedented investments in our minority-serving institutions through the health care reform legislation. There was a little piece stuck in there that most people didn't um, know about, which um, had a $2 billion investment in minority serving institutions, which we'd really like to see those dollars driving towards ensuring that those programs help students complete their post-secondary um, education. And then we also had $2 billion investment in community colleges to help build up the kind of programs that you're talking about. Pell grants are what students need to go to school, but the institutions need funding to help to build the programs that are designed for the Yeah, because if you future. look at the breakdown, right, the, 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 the penetration of minority, uh, particularly Hispanic students, to state institutions, because the laws that have been written by very conservative legislatures, the, the number of Hispanics is down, in many cases, even though the population is up. And these technical colleges and community or Hispanic serving institutions, the numbers are up. And obviously, your continued support of that as well. Question. Uh, well, my name is Ruben Gag. I'm a state representative from Arizona. And uh, my question is uh, more along the DREAM Act. The President's been a strong advocate for the DREAM Act, and I really thank him for that. Uh, I'm a little worried because in Arizona we've passed laws that makes it difficult for our DREAM Act kids to uh, pay in-state tuition, not to pay out-of-state tuition. It's becoming cost prohibitive. And I know that's happening across a lot of parts of the, of the country. These kids, at one point or another, are going to get right with the system and work we're missing a big gap in their education in the meantime and potential earning potential in the future. If, if, and I don't know if there's any programs out there, but anything that can help even some of these uh, students be able to afford at least paying in-state tuition at any institution, I think would be greatly appreciated. I have no idea what that is, but I'd like to throw that out there and hope you guys come up with something. Yeah, as you said, the, the President has been a huge supporter of the DREAM Act, as has the Secretary. It's something he feels really uh, passionate about. He actually, he and I went to the Judiciary Committee a uh, week before last to testify on behalf of the DREAM Act, the subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the DREAM Act. And um, if we could get that passed, it, would make, it doesn't require in-state tuition, but it just makes it much uh, easier for states to provide in-state tuition to their, to their undocumented students. Um, 
So we're really hopeful that we can get that passed so that we can make it easier for, for states to provide in-state tuition to students. Very supportive of the states that are moving forward with that. In the meantime, the DREAM Act would also provide access to um, federal student um, subsidized loans and um, work study funds to help the students that you're talking about to uh, achieve, um, to be able to, to afford college. And it really is the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do it from a fairness perspective. These are students that were brought to the country um, by their parents. They're doing everything right. They, they deserve a chance to, to, to go to college and to be successful and join the military. But it's also in, in the country's self-interest to help them to be successful because they will uh, be much more positive contributing members of, of our economy if they can get a college degree if that's what they choose to do or be able to go on to the military if that's what they choose to do. So we're hopeful that it'll, it will move to Congress this, this session. My name is Tom Elias. I'm the executive director of the Council for the Science Fiction and Walking. I want to piggyback on what my friend said about the secondary education. Uh, and I want to ask, uh, you know, we, we, we seem to have a policy on, on high school kids uh, that is really a policy that is promoting a certain type of mode regarding the kinds of schools that we need, even though it's important to do the comparisons with everybody else, we should be concerned about us here in this country. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering why is it that we don't have a, a visible, very visible policy regarding high school Latino kids and the completion of high school and, and the content that will allow these kids, once they complete high school and graduate from high school, from staying in college and graduating from college. We will sort of like have abandoned, in a way, the policies that make visible our commitment to public education. And I was wondering if you could comment on that. So I feel like that's a very um, important part of our policies. We, through the Recovery Act, we were able to secure $4 billion for our school turnaround initiative, which is directed at um, the high schools in the country that have the highest dropout rates in their feeder schools. So we were very purposeful in investing $4 billion in those schools to help them to reinvent themselves and provide the educational opportunities that the students in those schools need. We've also, um, in our proposals for elementary and secondary education, have um, made it very clear that um, high school graduation is one of the most important accountability metrics that we, we have. The secretary says, you know, often says third and fourth grade test scores are great, but they're not very meaningful if the students aren't actually graduating ready for, for college or, or career. Um, and uh, we think the, um, our focus on college and career ready standards is a really important component of a strategy to tackle the issue that you're talking about. It's not the only piece. That's, it's got, if we're going to help more students graduate from high school, we need to have a, a, a multi-pronged approach to help them to do that. But one of the things we need to do is to ensure that the, the standards in our system are aligned with what it means to be successful. We have um, too, too many students dropping out of high school, but we also have too many students who are completing high school and showing up at college, and they're not prepared for the work that they need to do there. So we really need to step back and and say that's one of the most important changes we can make in our education system is to make sure there is that alignment of standards from early early learning through um, K-12 to the post-secondary system. When we talk about, when the president talks about college completion, um, he, he has the day that he said that in the speech to Congress, he made it really clear that what he meant was degree or um, certificate program. So if you can complete a uh, career technical education program that is not traditional for a two-year um, program, that, that is meaningful and important as well. It just wants to make sure that those programs are um, designed to help people get jobs that will help them to support a family. And what we were seeing is that in too many of those programs that uh, students were dropping out immediately, they, when they were graduating with a ton of debt and weren't able to secure jobs. So the regulations that we were referring to earlier are really ch trying to get equality in those programs because it's not just about getting the degree or getting their certificate, but being able to be successful when you leave. One last question. Let me get one last question. I'm Diana Nathanicio, President of the University of Texas at El Paso. There's been a lot of discussion lately about possible changes in the Pell Grant program uh, to reduce the overall costs. And I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about 
kind of the direction that that's going and particularly the timeline on, on Pell Grant changes? So in, in this next budget cycle, we will have to tackle how we're going to come up with um, about $15 billion. The program's in a $15 billion deficit. Um, and from the administration standpoint, it is unacceptable to cut the maximum grant from 5550. We need to figure out a way to make the program sustainable and maintain that maximum grant. Um, there, we have proposed some changes as an administration along those lines, and they're tough changes. They're things we wouldn't like to do in an ideal world. One of those changes related to um, ensuring, um, eliminating the two Pell uh, policy where students who went to school in the summer got double the Pell as students who didn't go to school in the summer. Um, the, the proposal that we had didn't mean that students in the summer didn't get Pell, it just meant they didn't get double the Pell of someone who didn't go to school in the summer. But that's the kind of changes that we've proposed in order to feed the money back into the Pell program so it will be sustainable. I think that we'll have to resolve that by the by the by the beginning of the fiscal year when the next fiscal cycle comes through. So I think it needs to happen by the fall. Um, and we're hopeful that we can figure out a way to do that without um, decimating that program or other uh, student financial aid programs. But we, we think it's really important that we maintain 5550, and that's a commitment that we have moving forward. And the principle that the neediest students are the target of the Pell program will be upheld in yes. Well, great. Thank you. I uh, want to thank Carmel for her uh, participation. You guys did good for the first round. <laughs> we have a second round, and we have people coming in the second round. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you all very much. Great. And again, I apologize for not being able to get everybody. But again, the, the, the questions and the succinct questions that uh, we have and uh, our, our uh, guests and our administration officials are getting ready to just answer those questions as succinctly as they can. Uh, the next uh, two speakers that are coming are from, um, uh, they are from the Department of Agriculture, the USDA program. Uh, and that is Raquel Russell and Lisa Pino. And she'll be coming shortly. This, I'm going to use this opportunity to plug again. If you could, if you use your Twitter account and you're tweeting, make sure you use the White House hashtag and you use the uh, Hispanic Ed hashtag. That's hashtag Hispanic Ed. Uh, we really would like to encourage you to use that, uh, noting who, who you're talking with and, uh, and who's presenting. Great, so we're going to move, keep the conversation moving. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, please, um, we're going to, they're going to do a brief introduction. We really want to be able to give this opportunity for you all to uh, ask some questions. We have uh, 20 minutes again, and I'm going to have uh, Lisa and, uh, and uh, Raquel uh, give their introductions. Great, well, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. It's so wonderful to be here. What an exciting day, huh? Um, so just very quickly, I'm Lisa Pino. I work with the Food Nutrition Service at USDA. And I work specifically with the SNAP program. It's what we used to call the food stamp program. Um, so for us, the big challenge is that we have 15 nutrition assistance programs, everything from SNAP to went to school meals. But at the same time, Latinos are experiencing higher rates of hunger and higher rates of obesity. So our challenge is to figure out what we can do to amplify access to our programs. We know that we can't solve all the dilemmas of obesity with our 15 programs, but they make a big difference. And at the same time, how can we use these programs more as a tool for prevention so we don't get all the chronic diseases that are associated with obesity to begin with? Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. I am Raquel Russell. Um, I work here at the White House Domestic Policy Council for the Mobility and Opportunity Team. Um, that team is responsible, Mobility and Opportunity is somewhat vague, that team is responsible for several of the social, social safety net programs and income support programs from SNAP and WIC um, and school lunches to um, 
also children and families issues such as TANF, child welfare, child support. Um, we also work with the National Economic Council here at the White House on labor and job training issues as well. And last but not least, we work on, um, as Lisa was referring to, childhood obesity issues and um, work closely with the First Lady's Office on Let's Move, the Let's Move initiative. And with that, we should open up for Q&A as so we have enough time. George Alvarez with the Cuban American National Foundation. I was curious if there's anything, put aside the business of food for a second, mm -hmm. are we doing anything to nudge individuals to maybe uh, with these programs to buy healthier foods, whether it be anything better for vegetables, not allowed to buy alcohol, food stamps, things like that that are yeah. sensitive, but yet you're pushing them in the right direction? Uh, please do yeah, well, the SNAP program, um, people have the discretion to buy what they want to buy as long as it's a permitted use. And we also have you know, a, a component of SNAP that's called nutrition education. And what that means is that all over the country, there are localized ways and places. And it, it also occurs in the WIC program as well. So people can learn how to cook, how to shop, how to budget, how to prepare their meals. And that's a really important component. And I think also just to add on to that, there are certain things that are currently um, excluded from SNAP benefits. And Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, tobacco, alcohol are, are things that are excluded from the SNAP program. Um, but to your point of incentives on healthier foods, there is a pilot going on in Massachusetts currently um, just around that exact about you know incentivizing folks to use their SNAP benefits on, on healthier foods, um, fruits and vegetables, and so I think USDA after you know that the Massachusetts won that pilot, um, we'll see what that the evidence and the results of that pilot, and um, see where we go from there. We're covering a lot of high needy county schools, board member. Uh, our district uh, is the fourth largest in the United States, and we've been calling for the changes in the USDA rules uh, for feeding our children. We feed about two hundred. 45,000 um, children uh, in either uh, free or reduced lunch. Uh, and we're concerned uh, about what's going to occur with the new regulations and moving our kitchens from eating to actually cooking. And if there's any funding that's going to be provided for that transition, aside from the seven cents. Well, right now, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act is being implemented and has, has lots of provisions and components. And so, you know, how it will boil down to the specific district of Miami, I'm not sure in terms of other, uh, you know, equipment and resources. But, you know, for the schools to have the new nutritional guidelines that were put out by the Institute of Medicine, it's going to be a long process, and we're just beginning that road. So I think there's still much that, that remains to be determined. Our conversations with the USDA have been that larger districts are going to are, are going to be asked to comply first. Is there any information regarding that? We, we can look. We can look into that and, and get back to you. and get your name, um, contact yeah. information, so we can find out. Let's get somebody else. Do you have somebody? All right, go ahead. All right. My name is Jesse Beck. I'm going to the president of the Community Health Center for the Center for Research and Research. We have the number two highest productivity for welfare and work clients. The two things for welfare and work as well as uh, food program, we've touched the last about 50,000 people in the community health care program. And we encourage the federal government to think about a family-centered approach that can invest in the hope and dreams of families. This is where we have found great success. It's a demand side of it. We're good at your economic cooperation and optimization. We would encourage you to think about uh, taking these policies from a family-centered approach. Reverend Ibnunez from Phoenix, Arizona, National Hispanic Leadership Conference. Little louder, please. Reverend Ibnunez from Phoenix, Arizona, for the National Hispanic Leadership Conference. And um, I just want to tell Lisa, thank you for coming to Arizona because you're very instrumental in helping us set up a SNAP uh, center at our church. In Arizona, over a billion dollars are not used, that money that's actually allocated for, for food for families um, because of some of our very difficult laws. But what we have done that's been very successful to help us in the faith-based community is to set up a SNAP center where families can actually come to a church facility and apply for SNAP. And we do have help educate them in the different uh, programs that are available. We do WIC and the different Medicare uh, programs that are available to them. But we've seen a, a lot of people that said, I could not go to another facility or to a, a public state facility, but I'm able to come here. Thank you for opening up the door to the Space Center. But I think it's been a partnership with USDA and then coming out and the education they've provided to our organization. And we are serving uh, 1,600 uh, children a week through the summer feeding program. And an HCLC actually has 120 churches uh, statewide uh, that is serving children also through that summer program. But thank you for what it's done to help us in Arizona. I'm Jose Ortiz of this uh, 
Executive Director of the Stan Street Elder Council, Privacy in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, we provide senior services, and, and uh, I've noticed that uh, the issues of seniors have not been uh, delineated in the agenda, but uh, we know that many of our senior population are at risk nutritionally, and they are not availing themselves of these uh, services. And uh, as we know, there are many institutional and cultural barriers that preclude them from this. Uh, my question is, what, if anything, is being done to assure that the Latino population, particularly the older population, is being uh, uh, <clears throat> addressed? That, that there, uh, uh, are there any, any particular programs or policies in place to assure that they have easy access to these services? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that. Um, so at USDA, we've been working really hard to see how we can amplify access. And the three communities that were of most concern to us because they're underutilizing the SNAP program are seniors, Latinos, and the working poor. And in many cases, you can have all three. Yeah. So we have, we've already launched a pretty aggressive strategy that's everything from you know visiting localities, working with community partners, like Reverend Eve mentioned, uh, to, to you know media, you name it. Um, seniors are very difficult to engage. They only participate in the SNAP program at a, at a rate of 33%, only one third. And Latinos only participate in the program at a rate of 56%. So when you're trying to reach Latinos seniors it's a real challenge so what are we doing we're working with faith-based organizations we're working with community partners we're tailoring messages that can resonate to them because a lot of seniors don't feel comfortable using the program they feel more comfortable with our commodities program there's a lot of pride and stigma attached so I think that um, all of you as trusted leaders if you can help disseminate the message that everyone's going through you know when you're going through a tough time that's what these programs are meant to do they were meant to act as that critical safety net and to not you know, feel avergonzado, um, but it's it's to help put food on the table. I think that all of us can can make that difference together. How do you select your community-based organizations and partnerships? Because sometimes what happens of access is that you, you select agencies that are not exactly um, the ones that should be selected because they don't reach the communities as well. And that's why sometimes your outreach then becomes you can't get them because you're not using the top of the year. I'm really interested in knowing how do you select those partnerships. Um, well, actually, our states have outreach plans, and not all 50 have outreach plans, but we're encouraging all 50 to get there, so the vast majority of states do. Um, but regardless of whether or not states have formal outreach plans, we're, we've still launched this aggressive initiative. But I think, you know, as, as Reverend Eve pointed out, it depends upon the climate of that particular state, that particular community. So that's why it's really integral to have not just a network of partners, but a very comprehensive network of partners with real trusted leaders, people that really, you know, can be there day in, day out, not, you know, not just providing answers, but really providing the help. There's a question to the world. Carmen Delgado, Volto National Conference of Puerto Rican Women. What is USDA doing to increase its uh, uh, participation of uh, Latinos in its own workforce? It's been growing very, very little over the years. What are you doing to attract more Latinos to your workforce? Yeah, all of our federal agencies are trying to figure out how to how to do more in terms of recruitment and retention of Latinos. For our Secretary of Agriculture, Tom Vilsack, we're very fortunate because he's launched what we call a cultural transformation. It's really how can we have the entire culture of our department really reflect the diversity that's across the country. So it's everything from you know having more interns that we normally have. Um, reaching out at career fairs, helping people through the technical assistance of actually submitting an application. And I think also OBM, OPM has to be credited because under the leadership of John Berry, they've done a lot, for instance. Um, I think it's not complete yet, but a lot, you know, KSAs are no longer the way to apply. Um, and, and in some cases, they're more direct hire authorities where people can just submit a resume uh, for certain jobs, I think like nurses and, and technical fields like and like engineering. So I think that we're beginning to figure out, you know, how can we make this, uh, uh, how can we make this workforce not only serve Latinos in, in, in a more effective way, but also can, how can we have, have the talent that's out there that better reflects the diversity of our nation. Any questions on this side? Any other questions? Yeah. 
you're talking about J.R. Gonzalez and HPO, the National Hispanic Professional Organization, you're talking about doing the outreach to get more Latinos involved in the system. And you know that. What can we do as community leaders to enhance that, or how can we push more of our young and bright people towards you? That's a good question. Um, it's a great question. I think that, you know, one of the things that we, we all have to do better is have an op a, a, a constant open line of communication. So the things that Lisa was talking about and the work that the federal government is doing, making sure that we're sharing that with you so that you can then share it with your communities, right? So that they know what, what, what's happening here at the federal government and how they can um, become part of that federal workforce. As well as, you know, the other policies that we, we are implementing around diversity. Again, sharing that with the, with the, you know, the leaders of the community so that you can share that with the community, I think is, is important. I think this policy conference is a first step in keeping that open line of communication going. And I'd like to add two practical tips. Um, you know, I love that you asked that question. Thank you so much for You're asking welcome. that question. I always tell community leaders, you know, go to the Let's Move page. That's a fantastic start. They have so much information and lots of practical tips. Um, and they also, you know, we're, we're encouraging, you know, it can be a city or, or a town or just a neighborhood to start like a food policy task force or a food council or a health and wellness committee, whatever you want to call it, it's a great start. Um, also, our website, at FNS, uh, fns.usda.gov has a ton of information, um, which is wonderful. And you know, it's just a way to get the conversation going. But I think that just making use of all the resources out there is, is a wonderful beginning. Back there, and then back here. We have enough time for these three questions. Well, hello, Rosie Dalvin with Casa de Esperanza, National Latino Organization on Domestic Violence. And my question is, we're seeing a lot of survivors, particularly immigrant survivors of domestic violence, having a lot of difficulty accessing service or the kinds of benefits that can help them be safe and move their families to safety. For example, those who receive a U visa can't get public benefits, whereas those who get a T visa for trafficking can, but not victims of crime who get the U. Or also the five-year bar for lawful permanent residents to access public benefits is a huge impediment to those who are survivors of domestic violence. And that's what we're doing to address that. Well, I mean, Congress has to make those decisions, um, and you know, right now we have the residency requirements set from the last farm bill, and so because those residency requirements, uh, citizenship requirements, have changed, we find that there's a lot of confusion about who's eligible or not eligible. So we're just trying to make it more transparent and clear to understand who is eligible right now. So actually, last week, uh, the SNAP program just launched its, its new guidance on citizenship requirements, which is within the FNS website. So I encourage all of you to read it and just, just spread the word. Because when I mentioned the 56% participation rate, that's only about half of all the eligible Hispanics. That means that there are at least another 6 million Latinos out there that are probably struggling to put food on the table and can get you know an extra from $200 to $600 per household, and, uh, and, and they're not on the program. Hi, Joaquin Gavino with the Campaign for Community Change. Uh, you've talked about Let's Move, and uh, one, I wanted to commend you all on the, uh, well, the Let's Move program, uh, especially with the video that Beyonce did. Uh, I've heard lots of really great things from the folks that I know all over the country about that. And I'm curious if there's any, uh, if it's on y'all's radar to maybe do something like that in Spanish uh, to target like a Spanish language audience as well, because while Beyonce crosses borders, I guess, uh, <laughs> it would be you know, great if there was something targeted to the Latino community that that was going to be Joe Torres, uh, with the San Francisco uh, with the Democrats. Uh, uh, Lisa, I think you, you know this issue. It's, a, it's something that uh, obviously you've been involved in. It has to do with uh, Latino immigrants, uh, because Latino immigrants uh, is a very vulnerable population, particularly in regards to the staff program. And uh, there's a low participation rate. Latinos in general, in particular Latino immigrants, legal Latino immigrants. And part of the concern, obviously, is the notion of public charge. Many Latino immigrants will not apply for SNAP uh, because of the perception that they'll be viewed as a public charge and will adversely affect their immigration status. And of course, there have been discussions uh, regarding that issue. And the law basically is that they're not supposed to be considered a public charge, yet ICE continues to, to make statements to uh, county welfare officers, uh, even to clients uh, that they would be considered a public charge. And so this is obviously a barrier and a serious problem. Uh, and I just wanted to know what, uh, what might be done in that area. 
Well, I think the citizenship guidance is a really critical piece to that. And because we're talking about social safety net programs, it doesn't just affect the world of SNAP. It's also that there's a lot of hesitation and reluctance to be on the programs because of whether or not a person's eligibility and participation is going to constitute them a public charge. You know, if, if, unfortunately, it's a myth. And uh, even though the, the law and policy is sound that receiving a federal benefit program aid, um, you know, will not make you a public charge, people don't believe it. And you know, it's understandable considering that there's a lot of confusion. So I think that just disseminating the message, whether it's utilizing the, the new guidance or talking about express eligibility, but just letting people know that being on that program is not going to jeopardize immigration status um, is, is a very critical piece to that. One last question. I've got a freebie. Come on. <laughs> any any last things you all want to say? Oh, one thing, just to piggyback on a question um, from I'm not sure who asked it, um, but some over here. You're talking. Lisa was talking about um, the farm bill and um, that you know certain things are done in legislation. The one thing that I would just add to that is that you know Congress is coming up on having to reauthorize the farm bill. Um, this Congress, you know, hopefully not the wood. Um, so you know policies, laws within the Farm Bill that affect the SNAP program and other, other programs um, through USDA um, have the potential of, of being changed. Anything else? No? Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, and just a reminder for everyone, uh, for all of our speakers, you will be receiving their bio and their contact information. Uh, I think at the end of the day today, they're actually putting it together downstairs. So just wanted to uh, just remind you of that. Uh, our next two speakers, and they're gonna be here in about two minutes, uh, are uh, from Workforce Development and Office of Self and uh, Safety and Health uh, Administration. It's uh, Roberto Gassman and Joseph uh, Barrett. So they'll be short. Uh, if you have not done it yet, you need to tweet up. <laughs> and then also for those of you that in terms of your taking care of your personal comfort needs, the restroom is for men is straight across the hall here. The restroom for women is all the way down the hall to your right. So women all the way down the hall to your right, men is straight here. And like I said, we have a couple more minutes before the next people come if you want to be able to take care of it.
jump in and get right into the questions. They know the drill already. They know to just do their name and get into the questions and answers. And this group has been really great about keeping their questions succinct uh, and getting to the point. And again, my role as a facilitator is to make sure that people that have not asked questions get picked on. So if you have not uh, asked any questions, raise your hand high and you will get chosen. But obviously, we want to use this time as effectively as possible. So I'm going to have them do their intro introduction so we can begin. OK, my name is Jordan Barab. I'm the Deputy Assistant Secretary with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, trying to keep workers alive and healthy on the job. Um, Latino workers suffer a much higher rate of injury, illness, and death on the job because they do more dangerous work. They have other barriers, language barriers, especially in these difficult economic times when workers are very reluctant to complain about health and safety conditions. We're making sure we reach out so that Latino workers know about the hazards they face on the job and more important their rights on the job to complain about health and safety uh, conditions without retaliation so we are reaching out to a lot of community groups state labor groups uh, faith faith-based groups to make sure that they understand and that they can basically represent these workers and get this information out good morning I'm Roberta Gassman I'm the deputy assistant secretary in the employment and training administration and the focus of our administration is working with the states and with regional workforce development boards and labor and business and community groups. We oversee this, the uh, national public workforce system and our goal is good jobs for everyone and career ladders up so that people can have access, all people, hopefully to a, a middle class life. And we know that Latinos have higher rates of unemployment and we're very focused on that. We also run the unemployment insurance program, we run the apprenticeship program, the job corps, and we have some funding opportunities that I want to make sure you know about as well. Hello, I'm Nancy Lepink and I'm the Acting Administrator for the Wage and Hour Division of the United States Department of Labor. The Wage and Hour Division is responsible for minimum wage, overtime, child labor, the Davis-Bacon Prevailing Wage Act, Service Contract Act, uh, Migrant Seasonal Farm Worker Protection Act, the Ocean Field Sanitation um, reg Regulations, the Family Medical Leave Act, and the Worker Protections under the H-1B, H-2B, and H-2A uh, non-immigrant non visa programs. I'm going to just so pass small this. Portfolio. Just a small <laughs> And I'm going to just pass this out to not take any more time on things that we've been working on that I think that are of particular import um, to the Hispanic community. I'm Sarah Manzano-Diaz, and I'm the director of the Women's Bureau. 
our agency rep is the only federal agency that represents the, the concerns of working women, and there are 72 million of us in the workplace. Um, I'd like to share with you that in all categories, Latinas in the workforce are in the bottom of the barrel. So for example, one issue is equal pay. Although Anglo women earn 80 cents to a dollar, Latinas only earn 59 cents to a dollar. Again, the issue of, of jobs and training, uh, many of the Latinas are in the lower paying sector jobs like service industry, like retail. And so as a result, they don't have the benefits as well. The other issue that I want to raise is the issue of violence in the workplace. Women end up dying more disproportionately in homicides in the workplace than men. Um, and Latinas have their share of that. The other piece is that there are 50 million, I mean there's 50% of the workforce is now women. And as a result, the issue of workplace flexibility is time has come. How do you balance work and life? And we are also talking about trying to get women into the higher paying jobs of tomorrow. So we're coming out with a guide explaining what green jobs are for women in, in the fall. And now uh, we're also coming out with a trauma guide for homeless women veterans. We have a lot of Latinas who serve and serve very valiantly for our country. And many of them come back with issues that we need to address in order to reintegrate them back. So on July 20th, we will be doing a launch of our trauma guide. Thank you. Great. Let's jump into questions. Yes, right here. Um, my name is is not responsible for okay. e verify and um, I think that you know I know that there is a lot of things in the mix um, but that's primarily Homeland Security um, and so consequently I think there is an integration there is and that might be a, a better question there but, but the wage and hour division no longer does I-9 uh, reviews as part of its investigations uh, basically we enforce the law and we do not look at uh, status uh, whatsoever when we are in the workplace and ensuring that workers are receiving the protections that the law requires. Great. Yes. As far as the Latinas in the workplace and being able to uh, level and balance and working line, um, oh, by the way, I'm Diana Rodriguez with Sacramento City and Five State District. Um, but one of the things that I find is that, you know, to push young women into the workforce to build the confidence for themselves at the early levels. Um, the programs just seem like a hit and miss out here, but with the, more of the homegrown level, um, they don't really kind of know what they're really doing. Is there any policy or is there any program from the federal level that will set a standard for many of the programs that are out there? I think with regard to the issue of girls and the issue of confidence, one of the things that we realize as part of the Women's Bureau is that the girls and the issue of education are critical because that's the pipeline into the workforce. And for example, STEM is an issue that we are pushing, science, technology, engineering, and math, but we also know the study show we have to get the girls early on. Part of what has to happen is that there has to be a connect with the schools and the community-based organizations as well as with us so that we can partner to try to push that kind of policy forward and the Department of Education is doing a lot of that right now because we understand that also businesses need to be engaged in the schools so that we can create those future workers of tomorrow. I guess I will just add to that that in the, in the workforce system when we work with the states and the boards, uh, right now, uh, based on 10 data of the um, uh, adult pop labor force, 15% is Latino as of 10 data. The estimate is by 2018 it's going to be 18%. Participation in our adult programs is a little bit lower than that with the Latino population, but for youth, actually in our youth programs, 27% of the participants right now are Latino which is telling us, uh, I mean, our goal is that the boards are supposed to uh, advance diversity, have diverse de decision makers uh, as they make decisions on which programs to fund, and one of their goals is diversity and outcomes. So we want to see these kind of uh, more promising statistics as we go forward continue to grow. Back there, please. 
I'm going to stand up because otherwise I can't hear me nor see me. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Valdez. I'm um, an organizer with the Industrial Areas Foundation from the great state of Texas. Uh, there, we have created nonprofits in uh, in Texas and Arizona, California, Louisiana, and uh, other states that are partnering with community colleges as well as employers as well as the community, the, the individuals that are in needing of long-term job training. As we all recognize, short-term training does not take you but to a minimum wage job in most cases. And so the more that we're able to focus on graduating people um, with the skills, associate degree, or certification for the jobs that are in demand in that local economy, uh, are we going to be able to be successful? And these programs have been successful. They have a proven track record over 18 years in some cases, graduating uh, people with uh, an average wage of $20 an hour with a career path. Uh, and they also provide social all the, the social services that that person needs. So it's a holistic approach at training. It's not just a giving them tuition for and or books, but it's also looking at childcare and how did you get to school and so forth. But the challenge has been that we were successful in Texas in getting the state of Texas to allocate for the first time money for long-term job training. But the challenge has been getting the Department of Labor uh, to match uh, some of these uh, funds. So uh, help us uh, understand. Well, one thing I can speak to is uh, during the Recovery Act to help our country come out of crisis, we did see an increase in the dollars that could go into training. Now, given some of the fiscal pressures that we're facing, we're going back to the levels that we were at before the Recovery Act. But I do want you to know that we've been putting new dollars out, any of the dollars that we have, a whole big chunk, they're targeted to uh, helping have pathways into community colleges, because you are right, if you get those skills, if you get the, the training, any remedial work you need at the same time, you are on a pathway to good paying jobs. Uh, so a first round of $500 million in grants to help people through community colleges, that has gone out from DOL. The grant I want to make sure you all know about, because now would be the time to work with your regional partners, and I've got cards, and you can give me your cards if you want more info. The Workforce Innovation Fund, even in these times, we're making $125 million available on a competitive basis. The grants will go out uh, this fall. We're in a big stakeholder input process now, so now is the time on our website to give us your feedback on how these should work. The grants will be announced after the first of the year, and an emphasis will be in communities on having partnerships in place. So it shouldn't only be community colleges, employers, labor, the boards, it should be community groups too. And I think that's a way that can help. And I've got some contact information for that. Great. Yes. Uh, Carmen Delgado Volto, National Conference of Puerto Rican Women. Can you tell us with uh, Latinas, and in particular, and Latinos in general, are having access to the green jobs? And what can we do uh, to promote that? Um, I will tell you, and I got asked in the last session actually for the data, and I have a card to get back to someone. I will get the data. Um, we, we know from the states, uh, because it was in the Recovery Act where a big push was put on the jobs of the future, on innovation, and that includes green jobs in energy and the utilities. Um, and we, we get the data from the states. I want to look at how it is broken down by race and what we can see in terms of the Latino, Latina population. So, you as well. Excuse me, in response to that, Carmen, we're coming out with our guide for uh, green jobs for women. Part of the reason why we're doing that is that we want to make sure there's a conscious inclusion of women as the economy continues to green. What we like to say is that all jobs can be green, so it's the greening of the jobs that we have plus the new innovative jobs of tomorrow. We're here and then over here. Cristian Ramos with uh, NDN, and I know DOL doesn't isn't in charge of administering e verified, but if it does become mandatory, will DOL assist workers who lose their jobs due to errors in the e verified database 
We know from uh, CPT data that women and minorities are the most affected by defaults in the Social Security database. So we want to know if workers under lose their jobs through no fault of their own, through using this government mandated program, <coughs> DOL help them in that event. Um, I don't know that, um, I, I don't think we've, it's not a reason we're not answering is because I don't think that we've gotten that far to know what the fallout will be. I mean, I do know that the, the risk in E-Verify is that you're going to have a greater utilization of your H-2A and H-2B programs, and that is going to have a potential impact on your domestic workforce. Uh, so also, so consequently, I think that the Wage and Hour Division and ETA would need to uh, start working through those issues and what role we have to play in making response. I mean, our goal as we run the workforce system is working with the states and the boards, two things to help people who've lost their jobs uh, and are being harmed. And you know, one whole part of it is to give them a connection to our, to services, uh, assessment, skills, testing, training to help them with the next step. Um, there'd be, uh, and I'll have to look at this. I don't know this off the top of my head in terms of eligibility for unemployment insurance, where folks are eligible, and in this particular. Uh, in this particular situation, I have to check that. Good morning. I'm Jose Barra with the Oregon Latino Leadership Caucus. My question is in regards to the uh, guest worker program. You know, Oregon is uh, home to many of uh, those people that are brought in six months visas. We have uh, people uh, spending days, weeks at the hotels with, with that work. Uh, last week I, I came across 60 people that they have been waiting there for, for months. So what measures do we have in place to make sure that we review that program? And if people are brought with a visa, uh, make sure that they, uh, the terms of the contract are, are fulfilled. And I tried to get a, get some type of assistance in Oregon. And, uh, it was it was hard, hard to get an answer. Yes, sir. Uh, and I want to make sure we get you a good answer. Uh, if you give me your card, I want to get back to you. And if anyone else has that same question, I personally am not familiar with the answer to that, uh, but I want to help track it down because it's really important. I mean, there would be a role for both ETA in terms of their certification process and also wage hours. So I would also be interested in your card um, because. Uh, certainly, if these people have been benched, we need we need to find out what's going on. Thank you. Right there. Hector Sanchez with LATLA, Labor Council for Latin American Advancement. And recently, we launched a report on the condition of Latino workers, and we found that we expected that Latino workers are the most vulnerable and the most, the most exploited workers in the nation. But something that we didn't expect at this level was to find uh, the condition of trabajadoras, Latinas in the workplace. Horrible working conditions uh, when it looks to wage debt, uh, health and safety, but particularly sexual harassment and race, the work especially for undocumented women. We're about to launch a campaign on trabajadoras, and we've been looking uh, for partnership, not only for organizations, but also with the administration. We met with uh, our good friend Sara Manzano, but can you talk a little bit about the issue of trabajadoras and what is uh, what are the possibilities for partnerships and what is the administration doing in, in, in that particular area? Yeah. And, and I would want to work with Sarah on that in terms of a response, but I would say the more we do together, the more we partner across the parts of our department, the better the outcomes are going to be. Sarah talks passionately and uh, eloquently about the fact that uh, women are suffering more in terms of wages and Latina. Latinas are suffering even more. And to hear other examples, as you're talking about, of actual abuse or hardship in the workplace, that doesn't meet the goals of the Employment Training Administration. So anything that we can do to partner with that, we would be open to, absolutely. Let me just say that um, one of the things that we've been doing is meeting internally to talk about the issues of violence in the workplace, especially when it comes to vulnerable workers. When you talk about hotel mates, when you talk about domestic workers, when you're talking about migrant women who are in the fields, they're very, they're very much, those jobs are very vulnerable to the kind of sexual harassment and sexual assault. We just had a meeting last week across the board in which most of us met to talk about how do we address these issues from a more holistic uh, approach 
cutting across all the lines. So all of our partners are working together to try to address some of these issues. We're OSHA is about to launch a new initiative also on workplace violence in general. We are trying to do more enforcement in that area. Um, if, you're, if you're vulnerable to violence, if you're attacked on the workplace, that is a workplace hazard. We don't have standards on that, but we can do enforcement under what we call our general duty clause. And we plan to do more of that to get that word out also to um, everyone, uh, especially Latinas who are, who are uh, vulnerable to that, that they do have rights in the workplace and they can come to OSHA to, for help on that. I think that this is an issue that's um, compl complex in, in part because uh, Wage Hour has experience in like areas of trafficking, et cetera, and we have trafficking task forces where we work with the Department of Justice and the FBI, et cetera, to uh, when we detect that in a workplace to respond. I think even that can be tricky, but certainly with uh, sexual harassment and issues of rape, um, you have even a more difficult uh, situation and uh, very uh, to try to figure out how to be most helpful, how to get the appropriate response to that crime uh, and not yet uh, in through routes that the women in particular feel comfortable coming forward. And so one of the things we're really going to have to think about is how do we intersect with the organizations where women trust you know, that they're going to get the help and they have more expertise sort of navigating the criminal uh, system to get the remedy that these uh, folks or these women uh, need. And, and Wage Hour is working on trying to figure out what role it plays in that because we hear from our uh, stakeholders that, you know, our methods for how we deal with things like trafficking and peonage may not be as appropriate for uh, particularly uh, sexual assault and, and sex discrimination and that's going to require a different kind of response so um, you know that's where you know the Women's Bureau etc where we start to sit down and figure out how do we build um, those connections because pre previously was if we found trafficking we had the network with the trafficking task forces we worked through particularly with the FBI and the Department of Justice to have a response but this is a little you know this is a little different situation and re requires a potentially a different strategy. Last question. Hi, Nancy. Hi. I was the gentleman in the other room who asked the question about green jobs. So I, I just wanted to just quickly restate it and also just refine the question a little bit. Um, as we all know, green jobs has been you know, one of the top three or five Obama administration signature initiatives, and that's been a great thing. Um, but I think after two and a half years of the administration, I think what our community now needs is a status check to see how the administration is doing vis-a-vis -vis the community. And also, I think, most importantly, a success rate check. You mentioned a few statistics here, which are great, and I think some of us would like to hear more about. But I think the big picture question really is, um, how are Latinos doing in terms of, and this is the refinement of my question to you. Uh, one, how many Latinos two and a half years have been trained for green jobs? And then two, how many Latinos after two and a half years have gotten green jobs? And I state it that way as you know, but perhaps many here in the room don't know. DOL provides training for jobs, but not so much actually giving folks a job. That's the private sector, that's folks who are doing green jobs uh, on the ground. So we need to understand and I think get to the point where, you know, how are we doing? How's our the training and then uh, success for the jobs? Yeah, and I think those are fair questions. I will say the Recovery Act, because for many it was controversial. Some people thought that's too much money going out the door. Of course, some people thought it should be more. But given the visibility of the Recovery Act dollars, which a, a lot of that was for green jobs, there was great scrutiny and measuring of those dollars. Um, the states uh, kept track of all kinds of data, and as I mentioned to you in the last group, I want to look at, in response to your question, um, not just the numbers that got trained by type of green job, but what can we see in terms of sex and race as well. And off the top of my head, I don't know that, but I think that's an important question. Um, Thank you. So definitely we're going to look at that, and I will get back to you on it. I will say um, that uh, DOL did make dollars available to try to change the paradigm 
um, and to not just train people, but to actually get them hired at the other end. I mean, that's when the training is useful, when people actually get jobs. In some cases, the technologies are new, and all the jobs aren't there yet, but weatherizing homes, inspecting homes for energy efficiency, there are some very innovative things happening there where not just a training happened, but people did get employed, and we can get you more of that. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, Department of Labor, this was the most productive session so far, which I'm not surprised. <laughs> Department of Labor. So thank you very much. Thank We're going to go on to the next group. So remember, all of the presenters, you're going to receive their bios and their contact information. So we can need to rotate to the other, uh, the next speakers. jump right in into our Q&A, so go ahead. Great. Good morning, everybody. I am Anna Gomez. I am the Deputy Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. We are part of the Department of Commerce. <coughs> NTIA uh, serves as the Principal Advisor to the President on Telecommunications and Information Policy. And as such, we undertake a variety of activities. Uh, obviously, we develop policy. Um, we also uh, study uh, broadband use and adoption at home, uh, and we have uh, several grant programs, one of which was funded through the Recovery Act, uh, which provided funding to build out infrastructure to communities uh, across the 50 states and territories, and, and the territories, as well as funding the uh, construction and expansion of public computer centers and sustainable broadband adoption programs. Why is it important? Internet. Hi, access to high-speed internet is important to participate in today's economy, and it's a major uh, imperative for this administration to get as much action, access and adoption as possible. If you don't have access to the internet, and you don't use the internet, then you're not participating in a lot of the 
uh, civil discourse, uh, you're not able to apply for jobs, you're not able to do a lot of the things that the internet enables today. So that said, I will now be happy to keep talking, I'm very good at it, or I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions? It was Recovery Act funding, so the uh, money's all been obligated. Uh, everything's being rolled out for construction purposes. Hi, I'm Jessica Gonzalez with the National Hey, Senate Jessica. Coalition. Good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, in 1993, the NTIA did a report on the role of telecommunications and hate crime. Yes. And uh, we think it's really important that this report be updated, uh -huh. given that a lot has changed in telecommunications since 1993 and that there is an increased amount of hate against Latinos over the public airwaves, but also on the internet. And so I'd just like to get us, we made the request a couple years ago, and I just want to get a status mm -hmm. update. Yeah, uh, we do have your request, and we also know that you requested that with the FCC as well. You know, content is so important, uh, and uh, what we want to do is we want to be able to see what it is that is causing Latinos uh, not to access the internet and trust in the internet is such an important issue. So we do think it's an important issue. We have been focusing mainly on the getting the access out there mm -hmm. for the use of Latinos and that is uh, what we've been doing. Let me talk a little bit about our Digital Nation report. Um, every year uh, this administration started again uh, previously, it had done so uh, under the Clinton administration. We have partnered with our Census uh, Bureau, which is uh, the uh, sister agency of the Department of Commerce, to study uh, the uh, broadband use at home. And what we've learned is that even though uh, households have, about 90% of households in the country have access to some type of broadband, whether it's lower speed or higher speed broadband, only about 68% nationwide actually subscribe to it. And those figures are lower for Hispanics. For Hispanic households, it's about 56%. And for Hispanic individuals, it's about 45%. Those numbers are not good. It's not good that a third of the country doesn't subscribe to it at home. It's not good that 45% of individuals that are Hispanic do not subscribe to it. So we're really trying to focus a lot of our efforts on identifying why and what can be done. Jose Ortiz Ortiz from Spanish speaking elderly council races in Brooklyn. And I think uh, uh, you're leaving behind a large part of the Hispanic population, the elderly population, mm -hmm. and these are individuals that need training. And yep. we run uh, training programs on two of our senior centers in Brooklyn. And in a year and a half, we have been, we've graduated over 150 seniors. And they have learned how to use the internet. But we need, they need the training first because before they can use the internet. So uh, what kind of focus is being paid to to assure that this training goes out there and uh, to provide, to assure that the uh, uh, community-based organizations that are providing services to seniors have the capacity uh, to develop the, 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 the training and also uh, to purchase hardware and software? Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, you know, the elderly are, are what we consider a particularly vulnerable population. Um, and, and a, segment of the population that we do think needs to be targeted in terms of some of these programs. So I mentioned the Recovery Act funding. We provided um, a couple hundred million dollars for what we call sustainable broadband adoption programs. And these programs provide training uh, for many uh, different types of populations, including the elderly, uh, and, and uh, in the use of the technology. One of those programs is actually here in DC. It's called Bite Back. Um, and I met this wonderful woman who, her computer broke, and she wanted a new computer, and she discovered that if she went to this program, she would get a computer after she completed the digital literacy course. And she enjoyed the class so much that she took all of the courses and now is certified and is going to start instructing other seniors in how to use the technology. So these types of programs are so important for a variety of reasons. Trust in the technology, trust in the content. A trusted center, she went to a community center in order to do it. And she was given a refurbished computer in order to continue using it at home. Yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Eduardo Mati, I'm a Puerto Rico. Um, I, have, I have two questions quickly. One is on net neutrality. Um, mm -hmm. If you can just briefly state you know, where are we in that whole debate. Yeah. Second, um, there are some regions, including my home area of Puerto Rico, 
um, that fall into the category of those pockets of like the southwest areas where I mean, the you know, penetration is very, very small and, and we, can, we have to increase that. Mm -hmm. um, no area left behind would be my, my motor right now. Yeah. Um, what, what are you doing about, about, about those areas, regions? And in the case of Puerto Rico, of course, an island, you have to, you know, which cable goes right. out there. Um, um, I just wanted to hear your, your yeah. thoughts about it. Yes, uh, and for Puerto Rico in particular, one of our infrastructure grants, but we've given a couple of infrastructure grants to Puerto Rico, um, is to build out both within the island as well as to build out somewhere in cable capacity to the island. Um, and so once that's built out, that will increase significantly the capacity for Puerto Rico. Um, on net neutrality, net neutrality is a proceeding before the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, which is an independent agency. Um, but I will say that President Obama and candidate Obama, um, and even pre-candidate Obama, uh, always has strongly advocated for a free and open internet and the benefits that derive from that free and open internet. So that's where it stands within the administration. Okay. Uh, Representative Ruben Gallego from Arizona. Um, I, I recognize the, the digital divide and broadband, but a lot of the uh, young Latinos, Latinos that I work with are excellent um, on their mobile phones. They do the research on the mobile phone. They, they do almost everything. Is there um, maybe any emphasis in trying to uh, uh, build a strategy around around that, uh, making sure that our 4G networks are, are more advanced so that a lot of these kids get to access that way? Because the idea of, of them even having a laptop is, is funny to them now because it's everything that runs off their phones. Yeah, I, in, that is the one good piece of good news for the Hispanic communities. They actually are leaders in mobile broadband adoption. Um, so that's very important. And I really appreciate the softball, even though you didn't know you were throwing it, uh, because the president in the State of the Union address this year announced his wireless infrastructure and innovation initiative. And one of the components of the wireless innovation and infrastructure initiative is the build out to 98% of Americans of next generation wireless, which is 4G and beyond. Um, Mobile broadband is such a, 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 an important component of our lives today, and for a lot of remote areas, it actually is a more efficient and effective way to deploy broadband. So that is an excellent question. We're actually very pleased to see the development of mobile broadband adoption among Hispanics. Um, one of the, the next thing that we're going to study when we do our census survey, when we do that survey, it's about 54,000 households and over 100,000 individuals. So it's a very big survey of this type. We wanna, we're going to now break it down to find out how, if they're using mobile, how they're using it. Because uh, we want to know, are they using just their BlackBerry, or are they using an iPad or a data card through a laptop? Uh, so that we can further develop our policies around uh, this type of uh, mobile use issue. Question over here. Hi, Joaquin Gatto with the Connect Opportunity Commission. Follow up to, to the use of like global broadband. I'm curious about what your agency is, what your agency is doing to, um, I guess, increase the speed of mobile broadband. I mean, it's like next generation. It's like it just seems like our country is just so far behind to other countries. Mm -hmm. In Asia, in Europe, when it comes to the speed of mobile broadband, we're barely moving into 4G. And I'm just curious about, you know, accurate, especially because Latinos are accessing the internet yeah. and their wireless devices. Yeah, uh, there's three things I would say with regard to what we are doing to encourage uh, access to higher speed broadband and mobile broadband. First of all, we're a Recovery Act program. We're building out high-speed networks to the communities themselves. This is what we call the middle mile. This isn't the last connections to the curb or to the household. This is the big pipes that go into particular communities. Those are important both for wireless and wired because you have to backhaul that traffic through something. Secondly, the president, through his wireless uh, innovation and infrastructure initiative, has proposed to Congress to use spectrum auctions uh, to help build out to the areas that don't have higher speed capacity. We know that there's commercial providers that will build out to ser currently served areas to get into that next generation, but we want them to get you know, further into the areas where they're not served because there isn't a good business case to serve those areas. That's what we would like to use funding to, to actually target. And then third, um, the president has tasked NTIA 
Uh, we are the managers of the airwaves, of the spectrum that federal government agencies use to work with the FCC to uh, uh, identify more spectrum so that um, commercial uh, providers can use it for commercial uses. Uh, a lot of the capacity issues that you sometimes see of the network is very congested. It's because they, we need to get some more spectrum. And everybody who's using their BlackBerry, at some point your BlackBerry is going to get really slow and if we can get some more capacity, some more spectrum allocated for those commercial uses, then we can see even faster <coughs> speeds and then the innovation that derives from having access to these act, uh, faster speeds. So thank you for your question. So we'll see faster speeds when we have more infrastructure? Or I'm just well, there's, to... it's different components. Uh, even the, the broadest peg has its capacity limitations. If we can give it, if we can get more spectrum for the commercial providers, then yes, it should free up more capacity so you will see faster speeds. But there's also the importance of the infrastructure uh, that's being built out. And we need to have policies that encourage the infrastructure as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Tony Weiss, executive director of the Council of the Pacific in Milwaukee. I guess I, I want to ask a different kind of question because you talk about access uh, to broadband and, and internet. But I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about the, the issue of access needs to be accompanied by policies that have to do with um, the prohibitive nature of the cost uh, mm -hmm. to many people in our communities regarding access. You know, what, are, what are you doing? What are we doing as, 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 as a country? Uh, to make sure that commercial vendors uh, do not engage in fraudulent kinds of activities that make access almost prohibitive in terms of cost and that there are such hidden costs uh, to, to the internet and to broadband in many of our communities that people cannot access it. They, they do it temporarily because it, it, it's a big thing. People are into it. But, but then they fall into the fault and, and their credits are affected. So, so we need policies that address the issue of access vis-a-vis -vis costs and what government can do to regulate uh, some of that uh, prohibited cost. Um, yeah, our studies have found that there's three reasons why uh, folks don't uh, access the internet. Uh, not interested, don't see the need, uh, and affordability. For the Hispanic community, affordability is the number one reason. Um, so you're raising a very good point. Um, you know, obviously we want to encourage competitive policies that will lead to whatever the market pricing is in a true market, in a true competitive market. Um, and then we're also advocating that the FCC, through the support that it provides uh, to individuals and to, uh, uh, to uh, schools and libraries, that it also fund broadband using those funds so that it can reduce the cost for communities as well as for individuals. One more question. Mine is about the E-rate program mm -hmm. that funds the schools and libraries broadband access. Um, we think this is such an important program. We saw the administration, you know, kind of made it a little bit broader or late last year. Um, but we're really concerned that there's no support for after-school hours staffing for the program because, you know, as our curriculum begins to evolve and include broadband exercises, mm -hmm. teachers in low-income areas can't assign part of the work from the textbook because not all the kids that they have in their classrooms have broadband. And so, you know, this was not a proposal that was adopted last year. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. do you think this has any legs or what can we do? Uh, I know it's before the FCC and not the NCAA, mm -hmm. but what can we do to make it very clear that it's such a priority to have the staff and someone who actually mm -hmm. knows how to teach internet skills? Yeah, well, it, you know, as you said, it's before the FCC. The E-rate is to fund the connections, not the actual staffing of the programs, unfortunately. Um, but there are other funding mechanisms and other programs that uh, that I think could be targeted towards providing that particular training. Um, so just a few examples, and again, this is our Recovery Act funding. Uh, some of our sustainable broadband adoption programs uh, actually fund uh, the training for the parents. They come in, uh, they take a four-hour course, they're given the refurbished computer, the students take the training, and then the parents and the students take the computer home, and what you see is much more active uh, participation by the parents in their students' education. Uh, a lot of the uh, 
private companies have partnered with these types of programs. So the Mission Economic Development Agency is one of those programs. Uh, the uh, One Economy, which is partnered with LULAC, is another one of those programs. Computers for Youth Foundation is an, a yet another of those programs. And so what we've seen is, so for example, in Brooklyn, the Computers for Youth Foundation partnered with Time Warner Cable and Cablevision, and they are providing either no cost or low cost broadband uh, access at home. Um, and so it, it, it's all revolving around the same thing, right? We need to have the training, we need to have the resources, we need to have the parental environment, um, and we need to have the low cost uh, access to broadband. And the hopes is by providing all of this digital literacy and the resources that then these people will become um, savvy enough in the use of the computers that they will then become uh, lifetime broadband uh, users. So these are all important issues and they're all issues that are being addressed in pockets. Um, I wish we could have funded three times as many as we did. They are terrific programs and if you have any in your local area I absolutely encourage you to visit them because they're doing very good work. Anna, yeah, one, one good question. Well, how about the two American National Foundation? I'm curious if there's any efforts or working with these new uh, open mesh networks? Like if they're working on that sort of thing, anyway, but I uh, see that there's any collaboration or helping that create that. Basically, their purpose is to create better access for individuals, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, you know, we like to say that we're technology neutral, and whatever it takes to get the uh, access to whomever we can get it to, uh, uh, or whoever we can get it to, is, is absolutely important. Um, some of the programs have used uh, some interesting technologies or have gotten uh, access. So, for example, in San Francisco, anybody here from San Francisco? Are you familiar with Plaza Adelante? Awesome. Um, the city gave them access to their Wi-Fi, um, and that was a very important way to be able to get that free access. Then they had their hosting servers. Some of those servers were donated by the telecom uh, um, equipment providers. Um, so every technology uh, that can be put on the table that can be used should be used, and so that hopefully answers your question. Great. Anna, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to see everybody.